So, guten Abend. Äh, wir kehren heute mal das Spiel um. Äh, mein Name ist Vincent Hediger und äh, normalerweise komme ich als Zweiter an die Reihe und äh, spreche dann im Namen der kuratorisch Verantwortlichen, aber weil in diesem Falle äh, die Reihe auch äh, durch viel kuratorischen Input von Laura Teixeira zustande gekommen ist, ähm, drehen wir den Spieß jetzt mal um und ich begrüße Sie im Namen des Filmmuseums. Ich hoffe, Urs Spörri hat nichts dagegen. Äh, Laura auch nicht, mit der war es abgesprochen, aber mit Urs nicht. Ähm, und ich begrüße Sie in diesem Sinne ganz herzlich zu, der, äh, zu diesem heutigen Abend in unserer Reihe ähm, Tropical Underground, das Cinema Marginal und die Revolution des Kinos. Ähm, wir beschäftigen uns heute mit jemandem, der zugleich ein Repräsentant dieses Kinos ist und sein Historiker äh, mit dem Werk von Joao Ferreira, der auch eines der, man kann sagen, zwei Bücher, die es, mittlerweile, die es bislang gibt zu diesem Kino, auf äh, Brasilianisch geschrieben hat ähm, und äh, der eben das, die erste Gesamtdarstellung äh, dieses Kinos vorgelegt hat unter dem Titel, den Sie hier schon sehen, Cinema of Invention und den Referenten des heutigen Abends stellt Ihnen Laura Teixeira vor. Danke. Danke schön, Vincent. Um, I will also show English now, since uh, the rest of the evening will be in English and Portuguese. Um, and boa noite a todos também. Um, yes, um, it's a great pleasure for me today to introduce to you um, the first of a series of guests that are coming straight from Brazil to this lecture. I mean, we have collected a number of um, international people to come and talk at this series, Tropical Underground, and today we have Renato Coelho coming, as, uh, coming from Brazil. Um, Stay to one to keep, stick to one language, please. Yes. Um, so, um, and um, I, uh, I've known Renato from Brazil, but the reason why I had the idea of uh, inviting him to talk about uh, Jairo Ferreira is because, um, not only because Jairo Ferreira is an important figure, as uh, Vincent has shortly mentioned, but uh, Renato wrote his uh, master's thesis about Jairo Ferreira as a, a filmmaker and critic. And this uh, master's thesis was published as a book, was the first publication uh, about Jairo Ferreira. It came out in 2015 in Brazil. 2015, yes. Um, so um, we thought it was a, a very appropriate person to come and talk to us about Jairo because um, Yeah, uh, it's a figure that is not so well known, not even in Brazil. It has been just in the last years being uh, rediscovered. Um, and um, Renato was one of the people uh, responsible for a cycle of films that was done in Sao Paulo about uh, cinema de invenção, about this concept of Jairo, and um, at which event was the, the launch of the newest version of this book, Cinema de Invenção, about which um, Renato will also uh, briefly talk in his uh, presentation today. Um, a few words um, before I... Um, finally give the word to our speaker of the night. Renato uh, has studied cinema at FAAPI College in Sao Paulo. Um, then he did his master's thesis, like I said, about Jairo Ferreira at Unicampi, and he's now doing his PhD. He's uh, almost about to finish his PhD um, about another important uh, and also not so well-known Brazilian filmmaker, Luis Rosenberg Filho. And uh, Renato is also a filmmaker, has done uh, a number of uh, short films, has been screened uh, in many different places. Um, he's also a curator, like I said, from like this uh, show, um, from this series of um, shows in, in, in Brazil, about uh, mostly cinema marginal, but also other things like uh, Zanzibar cinema or other things that he has um, been working with. And yeah, so I'll... Um, pass the word on to Renato and his lecture about um, Jairo Ferreira. Um, as usual, just to let people know who are not in, used to our um, schedule here in this uh, series of lecture and film, we're going to have first the lecture, then we have a short break, uh, 10 minutes, so that everybody can either get something at the bar, go to the toilet, then we come back to the cinema for the screening. We're going to screen the short film, O Guru Use Goodies, and then the um, longer film, about one hour long film, uh, O Vampiro da Cinemateca. 
And after the film, we have a chance of asking questions either about the lecture or about the films. So we hope you guys stay also for a nice discussion afterwards. And uh, please welcome with me Renato Coelho. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in, in Frankfurt, in Germany. Uh, I, I would, would like to, to, to thank Laura Teixeira uh, and Vincent Hidger. Um, thank you for, for the, the invite. So, um, Jairo Ferreira, filmmaker and critic from the city of Sao Paulo, closely related to the group of the so-called marginal cinema, penned the seminal book Cinema of Invention, in Portuguese Cinema de Invenção. He started his career when he was still very young as a critic to the birth of marginal cinema, or Cinema of, of Invention, how he pre preferred to call it. Pre predominantly in the productions of Boca do Lixo, uh, in English, The Mouth of Garbage, a film production hub that existed in the downtown Sao Paulo and saw the pinnacle of its activity between the 60s and the 80s. Redoubted for po popular low-budget films, mostly the so-called porno chanchadas, typically e e erotic productions, Almost always comedies, Boca do Lixo was also a safe haven for marginal filmmakers, such as Oswaldo Candeias, José Mojica Marins, and young directors such as Rogério Sganzella and Carlos Raichemba, among others who had migrated to this region at the heart of São Paulo during the late 60s, looking to make their own movies. Working as a critic in a small newspaper from, from the Japanese community in São Paulo, called São Paulo Shimbun, uh, be, between 1966 and 1973, Jairo Ferreira documented the entire of the production of marginal cinema, somehow acting as the chronicler of this specific filmography. He also played a va va variety of roles in many of those films. Screenwriter, assistant di director, actor, still photographer. He briefed the atmosphere of the Boca do Lixo, writing as a real insider who lived among the di directors, technicians and actors. Here is Jairo Ferreira. Here, the, the first edition of the book, Cinema de Invenção. Here, the third edition, that one that Laura have here. We could say that Charo Ferreira did for the marginal cinema produ pro pro produced in, in Brazil, something similar to what Jonas Mecas did for underground cinema in North America. He intensely published and stimulated their type of production, pre predominantly experimental and aesthetically radical, at a time when Brazil was under the rule of a military dictatorship. In 1973, he started making his own movies, led to exercise in filmmaking freedom, and in the language of invention he, had, he held so close to his heart. These are five short films, O Guru e os Guris, from 1973, Ecos Caóticos, from 1975, O Ataque das Araras, also from 1975, Antes Que Eu Me Esqueça, uh, from 1977, Nem Verdade Nem Mentira, from 1979, a medium-length film, Horror Palace Hotel, from 1978, and two feature films, O Vampiro da Cinemateca, 1977, and O Insignificante, 1980. 
here is a, a, a critic by Jairo Ferreira from São Paulo Shimbun about the film Orgia ou o Homem que Deu Cria by João Silvério Trevisan. In, his film, in, in that film, Jairo uh, worked as assistant di di director and actor too. Uh, he's, he's there in his photo. Uh, among the most experimental films attributed to marginal cinema, Jairo Ferreira's were some of the most subversive. From his works, Only o Guru e os Guris, and Nem Verdade Nem Mentira, were shot in 35mm. The, the rest were shot in Super 8, handmade films he shot alone or with the help of a few friends. Ferreira blends experimental film, documentary and fiction, works with found footage material, capturing other films directly from the movie theaters, appropriating these materials and always creating new significations. These works often comes... Sorry, the... These works often come close the being to, to, to being di di diary films, but the fact is he always opened up his life through everything he did, be it written or shot. It's impossible to dissociate Jairo Ferreira's films from his written works, as well as it is so... It, it, as well as it is to separate his artistic work from his personal traits and the different stages of his life. Both in film and text, Jairo makes use of the aesthetics of collage, taking advantage of what others have filmed and written to create new meanings. Some of his many influences as a filmmaker and free thinker are two of the most relevant Brazilian avant-garde art movements of the 20th century. On one side, the mo modernism and cultural anthropophagy, as co conceived by Oswald de Andrade, the appropriation of for, for, foreign culture for its re resignification in our artistic creation. On the other side, concretism, concrete poetry, from brothers Augusto and Haroldo de Campos and from De Décio Pinhatari. Uh, sorry, are you understanding me? <laughs> oh, I, I, can I? <laughs> sorry. I'm a little bit nervous because I never uh, talk it like that in English. Uh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Dur d during his career as a critic, Ferreira wrote for several newspapers, some of the most important in Brazil, such as like su such as Folha de São Paulo during the 70s and the Estado de São Paulo during the 80s. In 1986, he published the classic Cinema de Invenção, Cinema of Invention, maybe his most meaning, meaningful and relevant contribution to Brazilian cinema for. In the book, Ferreira wrote about Brazilian films and film, filmmakers he deemed as experimental. Con, con, considering as experimental and avant-garde, two terms that had already been worn out, the author came up with the term invention. Jairo transposes the, re, ra, ra, writer, uh, the, the, the writer types created by American poet and li, li, literary theorist Ezra Pound, Ezra Pound in the book ABC of Reading from, 19, from, from, from 1934, from the field of literary analysis to the field of film analysis. Uh, 
the, the book not only speaks about Brazilian experimental cinema. It's also organized in an experimental manner as vi vi virtually everything Jairo Ferreira wrote and filmed. Cinema of Invention could never be considered an orthodox or academic investigation on cinema. One of the best insights con con contained in the book is the idea of sintonias, uh, sintonies, like tunes, uh, experimental, existential, visionary, and intergalactic, binding different filmmakers and their film practice. The essential, fil the, the, the essential filmmakers for Jairo Ferreira Fó are ex examined in chapters, not only uh, the, the filmmakers from, from ma marginal cinema. They are Mário Peixoto, Glauber Rocha, José Mojica Marins, Andrea Tonati, Rogério Sganzella, Júlio Bressani, among many others. The idea of synthony comes sometimes close to concepts such as friendship or camaraderie. His, his written style is poetic and extremely personal, overflowing with affection for people and their work, and instilling an immense desire to watch the movies he talks about. Uh, now, now I will speak about the, the, the two films that we, we will we watch today. O, o Gurus Guris, a short film from 1973, is a tribute to Guru Maurice Legiar. Here is he, the, the Guru Maurice Legiar. The mythical founder and organizer of the Santos Film Club in Santos, a seaside city near São Paulo and also a tribute to his pioneering film club activities in Brazil. The, the film, short in 35mm, had Carlos Reichenba, filmmaker for, for, from São Paulo and close friend of Jairo Ferreira, as the, as the director of pho, pho, photography, producer and financial supporter. In O Guru e os Guris, Jairo Ferreira uses the character of Maurice Legiar, Sullen but, sullen but passionate for what he does to talk about Brazilian cinema and its inherent issues, such as the lack of an audience and general interest for national films, the, downsides, the, 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 the downsides of the film club activities, and the way for, for Ragni films are always preferred over Brazilian ones. In his film, which has comical in, in sorry in in this film, which has comical under, undertones, the Guru Legiar re, re, reenacts moments of of his routine working for, for for Brazilian cinema, as we listen to his na, 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 narrating voice. I want to call for special attention to the three-minute-long take in which the Guru. Work it up from the booze, in part in, in, in parts his teachings to young cinephiles, his guris, which in Portuguese means uh, little kids, young kids, uh, uh, around a, a bar table. O Vampiro da Cinemateca, now, the, our uh, feature film. Jairo Ferreira made O Vampiro da Cinemateca, The Vampire of the Cinematec, his first feature film between 1975 and 1977, shot in Super 8 with the same artisanal style already seen in his short films. Artisanal and solitary, since he played all the roles in its making, from the idea to the re re realization. He had the support of a few friends who helped or acted in the movie, but was the but but he was the one doing all the the the, the technical and 
in other works in the film. Jairo Ferreira uh, acquired new Super 8 sound equipment in 1975. The two short films he had shot in that, in that gauge, Ecos Caóticos and O Ataque das Araras, didn't have da, da direct sound recording. Driven by the exploration of this new creative tool, Super 8 Sound Film, and anticipating its possibilities, Jair started a new open experimental process of an uncertain outcome. That adventure led to O Vampiro da Cinemateca after two years of con 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 continuous work. Carrying his Super 8 camera wherever he went, Night Strolls Around São Paulo, The Boca do Lixo, The, the Underworld, Bars, Jairo Ferreira would capture sounds and images of the environments he visited and the people he in, in, in encountered. From this freestyle method arose new possibilities from experimentation and improvisation, and these scenes would be later organized in the editing room. Here is Jairo Ferreira uh, in O Vampiro da Cinemateca. While he, he was editing the film, he was filming the film too. Uh, he would often invite friends to improvise scenes, always always open to the creation of spontaneous ideas, making up fictional scenes, making up fictional sequences. Carlos Raichemba, filmmaker and Jairo Ferreira's friend, took part in three different moments of the film, playing, dif playing di diverse, ca ca di diverse characters. O Vampiro da Cinemateca was shot little by little. It's clear that Jairo hadn't beforehand the intention of making a, future, a, a, a feature film. Ne ne nevertheless, the pro pro project gained new, new proportions, mixing or or original Super 8 material and archival footage in which later become a 64-minute movie. O Vampiro da Cinemateca can be con considered a film that synthesizes the entire universe of topics around the character of Shadow Ferreira, as well as summary of his main working methods for film creation. The film intricately combines, as a collage, different sorts of raw materials in its, its structure. Some of them are images of Shadow Ferreira's life in the tone of a di diary film, the self-representation of Jairo as an author ca character taking a per performative path, images of movies shot di directly from theater or television screeners, screens, fictional scenes with factors playing characters, direct sound from the Super 8 film, archival sound, radio broadcasts, music, uh, and several, and several re recordings of the na narrating voice of Jairo Ferreira. Some main themes are discussion about cinema itself. Quotes from films, the use of characters as signs, like Charles Foster Kane, Dr. Fibes, and Zé do Caixão, the Brazilian horror movie icon created by José Mojica Marins. M more, more often than not, these characters and their inherent signs helped Jairo Ferreira portrays the imaginary of the city of São Paulo and the social-political landscape of Brazil at the time. Among the main themes and the, the theoretical notions around the Vampiro da Cinemateca, re, 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 regarding its form and its narrative structure as well as its content, 
are an, an anthropophage and its inherent anti-colonialist attributes, the influence of concrete poetry when it comes to the construction to, to the construction of cinematograph po po poetics, the flag of invention, appropriating the literary critic theories of Ezra Pound for the universe of filmmaking. Between these three notions, it can be stated that anthropophagy is the pre pre predominant influence, the beacon illuminating the paths of the movie from the perspective of a homology between the anthropophagus and the vampire. Even when Vampiro da Cinemateca delves into se several themes, it's still essentially a meta-film, an essay that's approached and discussed and di 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 discussed in the foreground cinema itself. An extremely personal and subjective, uh, extremely personal and subjective meta film, given the title character of the vampire is Jairo Ferreira itself, author and leading character, driving the universe of the film with his presence in the images, sometimes performative, as well as in the various layers of in. in in the various layers of his na narration. In the main appearances of Jairo, the vampire on screen, the author pokes out in images of unusual composition, sometimes enigmatic. Some highlights are the scenes when he appears in his house sitting in front of the Super 8 editor where the very film is being made. That scene. Only a... Uh, no, that scene. <laughs> Only a lampshade and some candles light the, the, the setting. The spectral figure of Jairo smokes a cigarette and the effect of the smoke skaters across the light as he reads the Manifesto Antropófago. Uh, in English, Cannibalist Manifesto, published in 1928 by Oswald de Andrade. In the, the, uh, among other sound in, in interventions. No, oh, sorry, was that one? <laughs> I'm a little bit, I'm, a, I'm nervous, sorry. <laughs> Are you understanding me? It's yes, Oof. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, <laughs> in a later scene, when he appears reading his own texts, here, now, that scene, somewhat poetic, Jairo holds the oscillation cord of a lamp. The only light source in the scene flights the lamp. His face appears lit and dark in a wild and chaotic performance. Jairo Ferreira is the vampire of some imaginary film archive, feeding off films to renew his blood and recover his vitality. As he stated many times, the filmmaker starts from his individual universe to, in a bigger sphere, bring for, forth universal questions, such as the very statute of cinema and of arts in general. Among the fundamental references and the quotes that make up the crucible of sign in Um Vampiro da Cinemateca, of signs in, in Um Vampiro da Cinemateca, we can find fragments of different periods and trends from movie history, such as Seats and Kane by Orson Welles, Underworld USA by Samuel Fuller, O Rei do Baralho by Julio Bressani, Triumph of the Will by Leni Reifenstown. Is it correct? Leni Leni Reifenstown. Thank you. 
Taxi Driver, by Martin Scorsese, and Esta Noite Encarnarei no Teu Cadáver, by José Mojica Marins, among others. In this, mich in, in this Michelania, we also stumble upon quotes from transgressive poets like, like Baudelaire, the Brazilian poet Orlando Parolini, Rambo, and William Blake. There are also symbolic lines delivered by, by Jairo from within the scene, like Only the incommunicable is able to communicate by Augusto de Campos, I only care about what's not mine by Oswald de Andrade, and To you, cinema is a spectacle. To me, it's almost a contemplation of the world by Mayakovsky. All these quotes coexist with reference to characters from disparate universe, such as Mao Tse Tung, Glauber Rocha, Karl Marx. Karl Marx? No, it's not correct. Yes. Karl Marx uh, and Jimi Hendrix, next to even more reference from popular culture. The endless themes that populate the soundtrack bring forth the co the, the, the connivence between sorry the, the, the endless themes that populate the soundtrack being bring forth the co co connivence between no <laughs> I'll try another time. <laughs> the, the endless themes that populate the soundtrack bring forth the, con, the, the, the connivence between e, 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 erudite and popular, which is essential to the film. In the sphere of e, 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 erudition, sometimes creating suspense or terror, Teams by composers like Beethoven, Wagner, De Debussy, Pro Prokofiev, Satie. I, I bring the example of the starting sequence of the film. While we, we see nightly images of a full moon shr shrouded in clouds, we hear fragments of the, 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 the martyrdom of San Sebastian by Claude de, de, by, 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 by Claude Claude de, 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 by Claude Debussy, which impregnates the scene with an atmosphere of mysticism and suspense. From the deep voice of the author, we hear the title, The Vampire of the Cinematic, a strange cinematographic adventure of Charo Ferreira. The theme by de, Debussy continues. A long, a, a long su, subjective traveling shot from the windshield of a car driving through an empty avenue during a rainy night. The, the ve, vehicle stops from an instant at the red light during the rest, do, doing the rest of the music, but doesn't take long to transgress the stop. A re, restrictive sign as soon as the symphony come back uh, as soon as the symphony comes back with vigor in a metaphorical act to inaugurate the film symbolizing what what's yet to come debussy music debussy mu, de, debussy musical piece The, the, the Martyrdom of San Sebastian, which, which returns at other times in Vampiro da Cinemateca, also su suggests other uh, analogies and discussions reg 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 regarding the theme of androgyny present in the film. If we keep in mind the re representation of San Sebastian in the Roman Martyrology, usually associated with the an an androgynous. In the range of popular music, there are a Brazilian medley composed by names such as Luiz Gonzaga, João Gilberto, Gilberto Gil, Os Mutantes, among others. 
There are also carnival marches sung by Zé do Caixão, played in fragments at various moments of the film, scraps of speech and sinister cackles from Zé do Caixão, from, from Zé do Caixão also pop up at any given time, reminding us the character per, per, perpetrating them, an emblem of Brazilian anthropophagic horror, which pervades o vampiro da cinemateca from end to end. During the songs, the sound effects blind the sound of each sequence, like thunders, drum rolls and sirens. Intertwined with the aural, with the aural chaos made of scraps and noises, there is the narration of Jairo. In various levels of vocal use, alternating between voiceover and voice-off, the narration of the author character abruptly takes over the soundtrack, commenting the images, interplaying with other sounds, proposing ideas, thus conducting most of the film. On this anthropophagic va va in this anthropophagic vampiric menu offered by Jairo Ferreira, also stand out the reference and the digestions of classic fiction genres, cinematograph and literary. Cinematographic and literary. Sorry. Most of all, from gro gro grotesque or fan 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 fantastic horror, but also musicals and, this and science fiction, as well as reference to Brazilian movie subgenres, particularly the chanchada, popular the, the, the chanchada, po popular comedies produced between the 30s and the 60s, often around the theme of carnaval. There is also a satirical explicit tribute to porno chanchada and to the cinema of Boca do Lixo, when a penis pops in a close-up and ejaculates against the lens of the camera. As we hear the thundering na narration of Jairo Ferreira saying, this is a humble tribute to Brazilian porno chanchada. Parallel to the making of Vampiro da Cinemateca, Jairo Ferreira was writing the script, a tool that, that, that worked as a, 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 a guide, and aid to the conception of structure of the journey from raw material to, to finished film. The final screenplay, as Jairo Ferreira wrote it, has 78 sequences which represent what is seen on screen, with a few exceptions. The screenplay sometimes reads like a book, since it has annotations that are external to the film, notes, interpre interpretations and comments which help understand the reasoning and often la labyrinth paths he, f he followed to design the structures that make up the film. It's necessary to inf emphasize that the scenes in the screenplay weren't only composing fully in the finished scenes. That is sometimes the case, but other scenes were pre pre premeditated by the author to fit the existing material and later shot. At the end of the film, with the camera traveling around a bar in Boca do Lixo, 
record re, record uh, fi, fi, filming the creatures of Bo, Bo, Bohemia. The image does a close up of a fruit basket on top of the counter. Then we see selected fragments of esta noite encarnarei no teu no, no, no teu cadáver. Uh, the 1967 film by José Mojica Marins shot from the theater screen we see and hear Zé do Caixão in a final scene desperately screaming as he screams Re Re reincarnation isn't real it's a figment of my tormented imagination right before to the 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 end. The, the, the end lettering rap, a, appears with the, Mojica Mar, with the Mojica Marins movie. Here also ends O Vampiro da Cinemateca, with the final image of the classic film by Zé do Caixão, an icon of Brazilian anthropophagic horror illuminating the path followed by the vampire Jairo Ferreira in his strange cinematographic adventure. It's it. So, thank you very much, Renato, for this uh, introduction to Zario Ferreira. Very interesting. We could understand you. It was very good. Uh, thank you. Don't worry. Um, so, we're going to have a, a short pause, like I announced before, and then we're going to see the, the films. Uh, and a, a small disclaimer about the films. It's uh, all very experimental here tonight. Um, these films that we're going to show, I mean, the short film had never been subtitled before that we have prepared here uh, this week. Like, we're going to be um, doing a live under um, subtitling of the film. So, I apologize in advance for any mistakes or anything. And, um, well, we're showing both films thanks to Renato and thanks to Paulo Sacramento, who was also a big help, who's a person who was taking care of the, um, the state of Jairo Ferreira in Brazil right now. And uh, the subtitles for O Vampiro da Cinemateca we got from uh, uh, also contacts in, in Rotterdam, because the film was screened there in a festival that's the only subtitles that existed, and we um, corrected them a little, and we are also very happy to finally have film and subtitles together for our broader audience. So yeah, like I said, I just apologize in advance for the subtitling, but I hope it's going to be, uh, in the end, it's the atmosphere, the images that, that matter in his films as well. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, but like I said, first, let's take a break and we'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes with the screening. Thank you very much. So please welcome again Renato Coelho and Vincent Rediger. That was for Renato and Laura Teixeira. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have a discussion. Um, you can ask your question in any language of your preference. Uh, I think we can translate pretty much everything into everything else that is likely to be spoken in this room. Uh, <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> I have will have to restrain myself to English, but um, uh, if any kind of translation problem comes up, I think Laura will step in. Um, I just want to pick up on a line from from the film, which is the finished film or the finished product is the plan. You know, there's there's this one line, which, which is sort of a poetics of the film. You know, it, it works on pre-existing materials and picks picks up pre-existing films and rearranges them and I mean that's cultural anthropophagy um, but I was just thinking that you know in a way that's how all artistic creation works because all artistic creation draws on pre-existing materials and reframes it and uh, uh, you know creates something new out of pre-existing information so we're basically cultural anthropophagism as we see it at work in this film, is just the poetics of art. Uh, 
quite simply speaking. So this is what, what I'm trying to say is we've just seen a film with a very universal message. I don't know how you feel about this. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> yes, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing I found very intriguing is is that you said you made a comparison between uh, Jairo Ferreira and Jonas Mikas, um, both in terms of the role that he played as a critic and as a writer um, for the Cinema Marginal and in his own filmmaking, because there are elements of the diary film and, and uh, you know, there is echoes of Walden and other Makos films. Um, is this is this conscious? Was he aware of Jonas Mikus, or is this a parallel that you come up with? É, o, o, o Jairo Ferreira se declarou fã do, do Jonas Mikas okay. diversas vezes. É, o o Micas esteve no Brasil nos anos 90, eles se encontraram e tudo uhum. mais, mas ele nunca, é, assim, ele só, ele só dizia que gostava do cinema dele uhum. e era fã, mas eu, eu, é, que, acho, que, acho que foi mais eu que, que, que fiz esse, esse paralelo mesmo. Uhum. Yeah. Um, so just saying that um, Mikas, um, um, Jairo Ferreira did say he was a big fan of Jonas Mikas and they did meet in the 90s when uh, Mikas went to Brazil but that was also a parallel that Renato made when he was uh, yeah, making his analysis of the work mm. Porque o, o Jairo Ferreira escreveu em torno de 300 críticas mm. no São Paulo Ximbum documentando toda a produção do cinema marginal mm -hmm. Assim como o Micas é, fez no Village Voice com o cinema underground. É, é. And Jairo wrote more than 300 uh, critics or texts in the São Paulo Chibum, um, documenting pretty much all the production of the cinema marginal, just like Micas had done in the Village Voice, how is it? Yeah, um, in New York. So, so yeah. underground cinema there. Uh, by the way, Mikos was here last yes, week. Yes, yes, that's what I wanted to say. The big coincidence <laughs> is that Jonas Mikos was here in this cinema last Sunday. Uh, he, like, yes, yeah, yeah. he was in Frankfurt because he received an award from the Bedrai Biennale, and uh, but not this time around. Not this time. I've seen the last time I'm he came, sorry. but it's not this time. Yes, and then they screened here the film by uh, Douglas Gordon that he did now with uh, yes. Jonas Mikos. So but it's a I big mean, coincidence that they're talking about it now. It's, it's a total coincidence, and uh, we'll. we'll close that parenthesis, but Mikas has a connection to this region because he was a student at the University of Mainz uh, in philosophy before moving to New York. Um, he and his brother came to Germany first and started out studying philosophy at the newly founded University of Mainz. And then they left and went to the US and Jonas Mikas became Jonas Mikas. Um, the other reference that I was thinking of when you were Uh, in your lecture, but also as I watched the film, is Godard and the uh, Histoire du Cinema. Um, it's you know the, the 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 kind of treatment of film history and using film history as as the the material of an essay style film uh, reflecting on cinema on the on the cultural logic of cinema. That's something that that you can find again. You can find it in, in Godard's television work of the 1970s. So uh, uh, France Tour des Tours, for instance, has, I think, a lot of similarities with what we've seen here. Shooting scenes in a bar and putting a pop soundtrack on onto them, that's an element that you find in Godard. But, but it seems to anticipate the kind of poetics of the Histoire du Cinema by more than 10 years. I don't know if you think that's a valid reference. Eu, eu acho que, que tem bastante a ver, assim, que é, que é bem parecido. E, e realmente antecipando, né? O, o, o Godard era em vídeo, né? Yeah. So, yeah, he was really, in a way, kind of anticipating that, and Godard was doing yeah. video work, so yeah. it's a really different thing. But Super 8, I think, was, it's already my comment now, not translating anymore. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll keep to translating now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good commentary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, just, I mean, just in the terms of the, the technical history and the technical infrastructure, uh, for those who don't know, Super 8 with magnetic sound uh, was put on the market by Kodok in 1973. 
Um, so immediately, apparently, Jairo Ferreira picked up that technology, and, and I mean, a lot of the other Super 8 filmmakers in Brazil did so, so they latched onto it. But there were technical problems, you know, that are referred to in the film, with <laughs> because they, they were shirking uh, uh, the soundtrack and, and creating those problems. But that made that kind of filmmaking possible, you know, you could make sound films <clears throat> for very little money with that particular technology, and they, they used it in a You know, can you say something about that? É, o, o, o Jairo Ferreira, na verdade, ele é, queria, como outros é, cineastas brasileiros, realizar filmes com equipe em 35 milímetros. So Jairo did want, like other filmmakers, to make a film with a team, 35 millimeters and everything. E ele tinha vários roteiros, ideias, projetos. He had lots of ideas and projects and scripts that he wrote. Só que os produtores da Boca do Lixo é, tinham um receio porque ele era muito doidão assim. But the, the producers of the Boca do Lixo were afraid because he was kind of too crazy for what they were producing. Então, os, os únicos filmes que ele realizou em 35 mm com equipe foram O Guru e os Guris, que a gente assistiu, e o Nem Verdade Nem Mentira. So the only films that he got to um, make with uh, 35 millimeter technology was O Guru e os Guris, the short film we saw today, and Nem Verdade Nem Mentira. E foram financiados e produzidos pelo Carlos Reichenbach, o um cineasta que era muito amigo dele, que aparece que aparece várias vezes no Vampiro da Cinemateca. And both both of these films were financed also by Carlos Reichenbach, who was also to be seen in O Vampiro now, so he was a close friend of Shido. E existem alguns diários que ele escreveu enquanto realizava o Vampiro da Cinemateca e o Insignificante, que é o longa seguinte. É, e aí ele sempre fala sobre isso, que ele comprou a câmera Super 8 Sonora, ele, ele adquiriu né, esse equipamento e ele não sabia o que ele ia fazer. Tanto que o filme no início se chamava Umas e Outras Anotações em Guardanapos. Yeah, yeah. So he um, he wrote diaries while he was making this film with Vampiro da Cinemateca and also during his other uh, long feature, uh, O Insignificante. And uh, you can read in this uh, his writing that he got this camera, the Super 8 uh, with sound um, technology, and he didn't know what he was going to do with it. Um, and then it, actually the first name for this uh, film, o Vampiro da Cinemateca, was... Um, Uh, some notes on napkins, like some handwritten notes mm. on napkins. Yeah, so Super 8 was uh, the license to go completely crazy. Yeah. Uh, I'll walk around with the microphone. We have a question from Kerim. Yeah, thank you for your talk and uh, thank you for uh, choosing and programming these two films. I have a short comment and then a question. Um, I very much like the idea of uh, the cinema as a coffin with a window that we saw in the first short film. Did he um, show his own films, also the screenings that he organized in the same coffins that were around, or did he pick another venue? So what about the places that he showed his films, plus the screenings he organized himself? É, os filmes nunca foram exibidos de maneira comercial. É, sempre o Jairo Ferreira ele tinha os filmes com ele na casa dele e levava embaixo do braço e exibia em bares, em casas de amigos, é, em algumas mostras, até, até ele, ele, ele falecer em 2003. So there were no commercial screenings of his films, so it was also always something very um, personal that he had his films uh, with him and he would show it around in uh, bars or the house of friends, perhaps some screenings in um, small festivals, but it was more like a personal thing he did until he uh, passed away in 2003. E ele exibiu os filmes em, em Super 8 mesmo, em película. Yeah, and he did um, project it at Super 8 um, projector. Any other questions from the audience right now? I mean, you just uh, you described the relationship of, of Jairo Ferreira to the Cinema Marginal, but you also pointed out that, in a way, he was too too radical or too crazy for them. Um, the the films that we've screened so far in the series, uh, the Cinema Marginal films that we screened, the Super 8 films that we screened. Uh, o Segredo da Múmia, 
uh, un bandido da Luz Vermeja and, and uh, O Vampiro da Cinemateca, one commonality that they have is a preoccupation with montage and particularly sound and, and music montage. They all use, you know, uh, pop music, classical music, short segments, uh, and and there's there's uh, the beauty of these films, uh, uh, to, to a large extent, to my mind, is in the rhythm. And in in the in the way they interweave music and and image, and in a way they they really, this film too, I mean, creates a lot of really strong cinematic moments. I think the opening shot, you know, the the long tracking shot from from the car, with the the, the Hollywood film soundtrack uh, attached to it, is is one of the most evocative things I've seen in in the cinema in a long time. So there's a there's a lot of you know, a, a strong concern with montage and music. Um, I don't know if you share that impression and can say something more about it, maybe. Concordo. Tem o, o cinema marginal tem uma uma coisa musical muito forte é, e eles também resgatam a, a música da da chanchada, que era o gênero que o cinema brasileiro uh -huh produzia muito, né, dos anos 30, 40 e 50, os filmes de carnaval, samba, e so, sobretudo o Rogério Sganzelli e o Júlio Bressani, e o Jairo. So yes, uh, his uh, the cinema marginal in general was very musical, and there was a lot, lot of connection to to music, and um, also because they were making lots of reference to the chanchadas, the cinema from the 30s to the 50s, which was kind of a, very connected to music, to samba, and um, especially um, Scanzella and Bressani used a lot, and Jairo Ferreira used a lot of these kind of references. Um, and it was very important to them, I think, this image and music connection, right? E, para mim, assim, é a, a grande obra-prima do cinema brasileiro que usa a música da melhor forma, e para mim é o melhor filme brasileiro de todos os tempos, é o filme Bang Bang, do André Tonati. Que which, é... will, which will be screened in this series in the summer. Just let me translate quickly what he said. <laughs> he was just saying that for him the best film uh, in the history of Brazilian cinema and which that has this, this very important connection between music and image is Bang Bang from Andrea Tonach that we will screen here in Tropical Underground next year. So stay tuned. April 12th, I think. Max Jorge and the Cruz will talk about it. Um, in, in your talk, you made a, a reference to Ezra Pound and to also, by implication, the, the Cantos, but also the, the uh, earlier work. And you, you use this beautiful formula of the uh, connivance of the erudite and the popular, which is something that, again, in all these films can, can, be, uh, can be found, you know, in terms of the, the, the cinephile erudition, but also an erudition that goes beyond that goes beyond that, and you know, a literary culture seems to be very present in these films as well. So that that seems to be an important part of this artistic project of the cinema marginal to to bring together the the erudite and the popular, uh, and and uh, I mean, Ezra Pound is pretty hermetic and high modernist. Um, doesn't make that many popular illusions but can you elaborate a little bit more on the relationship between the erudite and the popular and the Ezra Pound reference é, o, o, o Jairo Ferreira começou a escrever o livro o Cinema de Invenção em 1977 e ele conseguiu o, o livro já estava pronto no fim dos anos 70 e ele conseguiu publicar só em 1986 So Jairo started writing Cinema de Invenção in 77 and the book was pretty much ready by the end of the 70s but he only got to publish it for the first time in 86, right? E pela primeira vez no, no Brasil é, esse, esse título de cinema marginal ainda não estava muito afirmado assim, é, se chamava de cinema boca do lixo cinema, o, o, o Glauber Rocha chamava de Udi Grude de maneira um Udi pouco Grude. pejorativa assim, brincando né? porque tinha uma uma, was uma contenda histórica né, entre o cinema novo e o cinema marginal 
Um, so um, when the book was uh, came out, this uh, term of cinema marginal wasn't so established yet. People would call it cinema boca do lixo, or as Glauber Rocha called it, Udi Grudi, which was also not such a was kind of pejorative term for underground. So. E uh, o, o, o Jairo Ferreira agrupou cineastas da, da Bahia, do Rio de Janeiro, de São Paulo e de Minas Gerais dentro desse livro. E ele, 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 ele te, o, o, o livro teve vários nomes antes de ser publicado. So what Jairo did in this book is that he put together um, filmmakers from different states, from Brazil, from Bahia, from Minas Gerais, from Rio, from São Paulo, which was kind of a new thing. And there was a, not a name yet for the book but until it was published. É, tinha um nome, era Udi Grudi Papers. Antes, the né? name was Udi Grudi Papers until é, working e, e, title. E, só que ele não queria chamar de cinema experimental ou cinema de vanguarda. E ele gostava muito dos poetas concretos, que eram o Augusto de Campos, que ele cita várias vezes no, no Vampiro, o, 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 e, 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 e os, os poetas concretos traduziram o livro do, do Ezra Pound, ABC of Reading, ABC da, da, da Literatura. Let's see if I can get this all straight now. <laughs> uh, so, um, it, Jairo didn't want to talk about experimental cinema or avant-garde cinema, so he was looking for a different term for that. And he was also a big fan of concrete poets like Haroldo de Campos and Augusto de Campos that were also quoted in the film. And they had translated the film, the sorry, the book from Ezra Pound, uh, the ABC, of the ABC of Reading. E nesse livro, o Pound. É, separa os escritores em categorias. Hum. A categoria mais assim, a, a superior de todas são, são, é a categoria dos inventores, que seriam homens que inventaram um novo processo e que, é, a, a, enfim, tem, tem, tem um... Uma... Hum. So in this book, Ezra Pound um, uh, makes groups of this uh, of the uh, categories of uh, authors, uh, different categories, and the most important one or the most uh, valuable one is the one of the inventors. So uh, the ones that invent a new world or something like that. Or a new so process. process. Or a new process. Yeah, that invent a, a new form. process or a new way of uh, literature. E o Jairo Ferreira se apropriou desse termo. Os, os irmãos Campos e o Décio Pinhatari, que eram o primeiro grupo fundador da, da poesia concreta do Brasil, né, em São Paulo, tinham uma revista nos anos 50 chamada Revista Invenção. So, um, so that's where this, this idea of the inventors came from. And the um, concrete poets in Brazil had a magazine in the 50s that was called Invenção. Mas é uma apropriação totalmente livre. O Jair Ferreira não tem nada do hermetismo que o Pound tinha. É, uma, é como uma, é uma citação livre. É uma, uma liberdade poética que ele tomou. But it's like he, he uses this term of the invention very freely. He does his own appropriation. Jair Ferreira, when he uses this as cinema de invenção, was more like an appropriation, but in a very in his own way and not in a hermetic way like Ezra Pound had used it. Or another act of cultural anthropophagism. Exactly. Do we have more questions from the audience? Anything you want to bring up? Um, I have a question, perhaps. Yes. Um, and um, I wanted to know a little bit more about how the other, about this, the, how was Jairus, we seen the film a lot about how, what Jairus thought about the other directors or when he quotes, uh, I'm talking about the ones from his. Uh, milieu there from from uh, Boca do Lixo or from Cinema Marginal or whatever we want to call it. But how do you have any uh, contact from the other directors what they thought about Jairus' uh, writing or his filmmaking? Um, what was this um, relationship like? Um, o Jairo, enfim, ele, ele era muito próximo aos realizadores porque ele escreveu primeiro no São Paulo Ximbum nos anos de 66 a 73, mas sobretudo depois no período da Folha de São Paulo também, no final dos anos 70. So Jairo was uh, very um, known, but also uh, appreciated, or yes, uh, mainly because of the texts that he wrote first for São Paulo Chibum and then for Folha de São Paulo. E ele, e ele escrevia praticamente só sobre cinema brasileiro. Então ele era muito amigo dos, dos, dos cineastas, muito próximo. Conhecia as produções de dentro, acompanhava várias produções, foi ator em vários filmes. Uh -huh. 
So Jairo was very close to the filmmakers. He was friends with them. And um, he he also was a part of some of these films as actor, or he was also seeing the films from an uh, insider perspective, in a way. E muito respeitado também. Assim, o, o, o Carlos Reichenbach, por exemplo, ele, eu, eu, eu fiz uma entrevista com ele quando estava escrevendo a minha dissertação, e ele disse algo como assim que o, o, o Décio Pinhatari falava de poetas para poetas, e que o Jairo Ferreira seria um cineasta para cineastas, assim, como uma injeção de criatividade. Mas, ao mesmo tempo, ele tinha consciência que não era para qualquer pessoa, que é um cinema mais é, difícil de decodificar, assim, né? So in an interview with Carlos Reichenbach, Renato did, um, uh, Carlos Reichenbach mentions that um, Jair was very important, that Desio Pinhatari, this concrete poet I've been talking about as well, uh, said that it was, was talked about as a, that he was a, a, poet, a poet for poets. Uh, and that in a way Jairo could be seen as a filmmaker for filmmakers because his films were not that easy to decodify, to, um, to be received by an audience, but he was also very uh, respected by the, other, by the filmmakers of the, of the scene. <laughs> do you have any questions or anything else you want to say? Yes, no, do you want to say anything? I don't know. That you, um... então, o Fernão Ramos vem aqui, né? Fer Fernão Ramos wrote a, a, very, a very, very, very important book, yes. Cinema Marginal. One, one year later, Jairo Ferreira... Uh, Published uh, uh, Cinema uh, do English. Uh, yes. Song. Okay. Um, yeah, for now... For now Pessoa almost will be here on January 25th. Uh, and he, I mean, there are two, there are two books on the Cinema Marginal, uh, Fanal's book and, and Jairo Ferreira's book. Uh, yeah. but, and, and now there's your, your book on Jairo Ferreira. Enquanto o livro do Jairo Ferreira é um livro mais poético, tem, é, são, são capítulos sobre cada cineasta e ele divide nessas né, ideias de, 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 de sintonias. Uhum. Então tem a sintonia existencial, experimental, uhum. intergalaxial e por aí vai. Uhum. So the, uh, we're talking about these two books, and the, but the book of, from Jairo Ferreira is a little bit more poetic in a way, especially in the way it's organized. Much more mm. poetic, okay, mm. <laughs> because it's organizing in syntonies. Like the, the the filmmakers are kind of split into groups, and these groups are syntonies, um, sensorial or um, what were the other ones? Experimental, visionary, visionary yeah. intergalactic, and uh, yeah. And and I think it's also amazing that that has not yet been so. Um, it's very new that this is present in the academia in Brazil, for example, because his way of analyzing films is far from the traditional historiography of Brazilian cinema, right? This kind of. Um, Sim, então, é o o livro Cinema Marginal do Fernão Ramos é mais acadêmico, enquanto o do Jairo é mais é. livre e poético. É. Mas o Jairo ajudou o Fernão bastante nas pesquisas dele e tudo, hum. porque o Jairo tinha ele, ele era um um grande arquivista. Hum. Assim como a gente pode pensar um, so Fernão's uh, book is um, Fernão Ramos, by the way, is coming in January, we just said, and he wrote this book, Cinema Marginal, which is much more academic and uh, more in a traditional way. But Jairo Ferreira helped Fernão Ramos a lot when he was writing his book with his research, because Jairo was also a big archivist, archivist and mm -hmm. had lots of material and yeah. Assim como a gente pode pensar o Vampiro da Cinemateca e outros filmes do Jairo como um grande arquivo, assim, um, uhum. um arquivo aberto, reorganizando a história do cinema, uhum. é, os, o, o, o próprio livro Cinema de Invenção é assim também. Ele pega trechos de duas, três páginas de escritos de outros autores, uhum. não cita, não coloca aspas, é antropofagia mesmo. <risos> So, uh, the same way that we can see this film, Vampiro da Cinemateca, as a big archive of uh, references and bits and pieces of stuff, this book can also be seen as kind of an archive that he put together in this text. He kind of gets 
texts from other authors and he uh, incorporates them without quoting, without uh, mentioning, without footnotes or saying it's really in a big anthropophagic uh, methodology to use these texts like this. Pelo livro, ele foi processado pelo Rogério Sganzella, porque hum. usou três páginas sobre o Mojica de uma crítica do Rogério Sganzella. Oh, cool. So for this for his book, uh, Jairo Ferreira was uh, sued by Rogério Sganzella because he used three pages of a text that Sganzella had written about um, José do Caixão, about José Mojica Marins, without mentioning his name or without quoting him properly. Mesmo assim, eles eram muito amigos, porque, enfim, o Brasil tem essas contradições, né? But they were very good friends, so, you know, Brazilian, Brazil is full of contradictions, so, you know, you sue your friend and whatever. É, mas os filmes ninguém ligava, porque eram em Super 8, e o Super 8 sempre foi considerado uma bitola artesanal. Hmm. But about the films, there was never a problem, because it was all Super 8, and it was considered like an amateur, or... Um, okay. A handcraft kind of thing, so he was never sued by using these images. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised by the news that there was a lawsuit because uh, so far, uh, I think what we've observed is a cultural blissful obliviousness to copyright issues uh, uh, by these filmmakers. Um, but since you bring up the the term and the topic friendship seems to be very important. I mean, what we're talking about here is a network of friends. Uh, this film is the product of a friendship network. Uh, Carlos Reichenbach financed it and he acted in it and he worked as the cinematographer. Um, the, the conservation, the tradition, uh, the preservation of these films also happens in, in family and friendship networks. So they take care of each other's films and it, it the films are not necessarily preserved by an official institution. There are no production companies that take care of them. So it's really the filmmakers themselves and their friends that, that make sure that these films survive. Um, can you say something more about the importance of friendship in in the Cinema Marginal and, and the Boca do Lixo network of filmmaking? É, os, 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 os cineastas eram muito amigos, mm. tinha essa comunidade né, na, na, na Boca do Lixo. Era um polo de produção de cinema popular. Hum. A, as pessoas que trabalhavam, os, os próprios produtores, os donos, eram todos assim... É, não, não tinham estudo, não tinham uma, uma formação. So, yeah, the, the people in the Boca do Lixo, um, seen, they were very friend, much friends, and they were very uh, close to each other, even the, the owners or producers, and not only the filmmakers, but there was like a very um, a tight bond between them. Mas o grosso da produção era mais comercial, eram filmes de gênero, uhum. que chamavam de porno chanchada, mas tinha de tudo, tinha western, tinha filme de, de, de policial, fi, filmes de gênero populares. Yeah, but most of the production that was being done there were genre films, so uh, there were a lot of these porno chanchados that we also have been mentioning here, but there were also westerns or other kinds of genre films that were being done by the, this e esses jovens autores que, que eram o Rogério Sganzella, por exemplo, era crítico, hum. o Carlos Reichenbach e o Jairo Ferreira eram muito cinéfilos, assim, muito, né, né, tinham essa, essa coisa de, de, de arquivistas também, o André Tonati o, e vários outros migraram para essa região em busca de conseguir produzir os seus próprios filmes, hum. cada um buscando uma alternativa. So these uh, authors that were, you know, either Gonzalez, there was also a film critic, or Jairo Ferreira, uh, Carlos Rachimbar, and other um, filmmakers, they went to this uh, region of São Paulo, to the Boca do Lixo, in, in search for a way to finance and to make possible the films they wanted to make. E outros mais antigos que já estavam lá antes, como José Mojica Marins hum. e o Oswaldo Candeias, que realizou em 1967 hum. um filme chamado A Margem, que por Jairo Ferreira inaugura o cinema marginal. Sim, yeah. yeah, and uh, these were some of the like new authors, but there were also others that were already um, producing films there, like José Mojica Marins e Oswaldo Candeias, who was very important because he did uh, in 67 he did a film called A Margem, The Margin, and for Jairo Ferreira that's considered the film that in initiates the cinema marginal, right? 
Mas os, os filmes em 35 mm a maioria foi conservado logo em Cinemateca, em arquivos. Os do Jairo, como eram em Super 8, e alguns outros também, que, como os do Ivan Cardoso, que eram que, que vários em Super 8, depois... Recorda filmes de Oiticica, Oiticica, sim. É, enfim, vários filmes que eram em Super 8, em 16 mm foram sendo preservados pelas pessoas. Né? Tanto que até hoje os filmes do Jairo Ferreira estão com o Paulo Sacramento, que guarda os filmes na casa dele e era muito amigo, muito próximo do Jairo Ferreira. So there was also a format thing because a lot of this production, the ones that were done in 35 mm, they were, they were kind of um, conserved by the Cinemateca Brasileira or some other institution, but the other films that were super 8 or 16 mm, those were not being preserved and then the the artists or the filmmakers themselves had to keep them like Jairo Ferreira or Ivan Cardoso was also a similar case. And even today, the films by Jairo Ferreira are being kept by Paulo Sacramento, who has the films at his house. He's a, also a filmmaker who was a good friend of Jairo Ferreira and who is the responsible, who we are also to thank to have this uh, copy that we received today. So, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, you could draw a comparison between that group of filmmakers uh, Boca do Lixo filmmakers and the uh, Nouvelle Vogue filmmakers because they were they, they started off as critics. They were they were a band of friends, and they got their break in filmmaking because they were able to make very cheap films. Because I mean that's one thing that we often forget about the Nouvelle Vogue. One reason why all these films got made in the late fifties and the early sixties is that they only cost a fraction of what a normal. Uh, uh, you know, feature film cost at the time in France. Like, Abu de Souffle cost one sixth of the average budget of a of a standard feature film at the time. And so, producers thought, I can get six films for the price of one, out of which maybe two are going to be popular. So they gave all this money to these young untrained film critics and said, go ahead and make films. And I think that the Cinema Marginal is a similar situation. You know, there was a, a demand for Brazilian films because of the cultural policy of the military dictatorship. It sort of became easier to make these films. And that was an opportunity for the filmmakers to get into filmmaking or for, the, for those critics and cinephiles to get into filmmaking. Is that the, the story more or less or? É, é, acho que acho que tem tem muito em comum com a com a, com a novela vague com os cinemas modernos ao redor do mundo talvez a, no, a novela vague seja é, é, na, na, na minha visão mais mais claro um paralelo com o cinema novo yeah. I mean, e com, yes. e com yeah. o sistema marginal yeah. também mas não não o que, o, o que existia era isso. Existia uma cota de tela para o cinema brasileiro. Sim, yeah, so, uh, yes, there was a kind of connection between Nouvelle Vague and other modern cinemas with what was going on in Brazil, but it was also a lot, uh, it was perhaps more comparable to the cinema novo and also a little bit to cinema marginal, but yeah, it was a little different. So there was a, a context that was allowing this, which was the cota de tela, which was a um, a number of films that ne needed to be Brazilian, the films being screened in commercial cinemas that needed to be uh, national product. Right. E no início do cinema marginal, os filmes eram mais populares, como O Bandido da Luz Vermelha, A Mulher de Todos e alguns outros. Hmm. Os produtores queriam financiar, existia uma promessa que os filmes seriam de gênero e meio eróticos. So in the beginning of Cinema Marginal, some of the films were more popular. They were also um, like Bandido da Luz Vermelha or A Mulher de Todos. Um, they were a kind of a promise that there would be a little more genre films, a little bit erotic, which was also common at the time. So there was this hope also for the producers that uh, there, there wouldn't be a total failure either. Yeah. Mas no fim de, de 1968, hum. com o, o, o ato institucional número 5, chamado AI-5, hum. que foi, enfim, uma... Como chama isso? Uma, um ato é, criado pelos militares, pelo governo militar, que restringia diversas liberdades no Brasil. E a censura ficou muito mais forte. Hum. O cinema novo uh, encontrou uma, uma saída de ser mais alegórico. Hum. O Macunaíma, o Brasil Ano 2000, 
o Dragão da Maldade e por aí vai. O cinema marginal nisso ficou mais underground ainda, porque... E os filmes, consequentemente, ficaram mais radicais, como Bang Bang, é. como Jairo, a partir de 68. Eram filmes que assim, a, a grande maioria dos, dos, dos cineastas e dos produtores nem submetiam à censura, porque sabiam que os filmes seriam apreendidos. É. Então nem acabaram sendo exibidos comercialmente. É, tudo bem. É, so it was uh, important historically to to realize that 19 that we were talking about the 60s and then in 1968 in Brazil there was the I5 which was a, a set of rule new rules from the military dictatorship and which strengthened the the, the regime and also the censorship in Brazil and then um, there were two ways like the cinema novo kind of found a way out of this censorship by being more allegoric than before like Macunaíma or um, Brasil no 2000 and some other films, and for Cinema Marginal, the way out was to become even more underground and even more radical, which is what we see by this film in Jair Ferreira, um, and, and Bang Bang, and um, other films, and that the producers wouldn't even, normal, usually they would have to um, apply the films for, for the approval of the military uh, dictatorship, and the producers wouldn't even uh, apply these films because they knew they would be... Um, they wouldn't be allowed, so they were just kept away from this system, kind of. Por isso, muitos filmes ficaram escondidos durante diversos anos. Tiveram pouquíssimas exibições. É... Como se fala quando não pode ter exibição? É... É... Era ilegal mostrar o filme? Legal, é. é. So that's why many of these films were never shown or for, for a long time not shown, not shown public. They were kind of legal films or um, because they were so subversive, no? But um, I mean, a film like O Bandido Luz Vermelha was a commercial success. And yes. they were, I mean, the, the early films of, of Scanzello were actually more commercially successful than any of the Cinema Novo films yeah. for, for a certain time. But they, they flew under the radar because they seemed innocuous, they seemed sort of apolitical. But I mean, we watched uh, O Bandido Luz Vermelha last week. It's an eminently political film. It's like super political. <laughs> são, é. são muito políticos e feitos num momento que ainda existia alguma liberdade de, de criação. Yeah, these kind of films are very political, but they were done in a moment where there was still some kind of freedom in the creation process. Dois anos depois, o Sganzella se, se juntou com o Júlio Bressani e criou a produtora Bel Air. E são filmes assim, extremamente... É, extremamente subterrâneos que não foram exibidos em lugar nenhum, não foram submetidos à censura. Hum. Isso, isso dois anos depois, né? Hum. Então teve, teve, teve esse. E then only two years later, after doing Bandido da Luz Vermelha, uh, Sganzella would team up with Giulio Bressani and they uh, made a, a production company Bel Air. And then their films became a lot more uh, radical and also um, they were not seen anywhere because they were not being, this, with this problem with the censorship, not even that they were censored, but they were even, not even being applying for the law mm -hmm. to, to be shown. So these films kind of were kept from the audience for, for a while. Yeah. Uh, for now, Sr. Ramos is actually going to talk about uh, Bel Air films and, yes. and Leo Bressani. Sem essa aranha. Yeah. yeah, this is a good program. <laughs> <laughs> Very good program. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, otherwise, we just keep talking here. And <laughs> <laughs> can sit in the bar and talk. And, uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, if there uh, are no more questions, we can yeah, we can so call it a night. Call it a day, or call it a night. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much for Thank you. coming, and thanks again, uh, Renato, for a wonderful talk and a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, we will resume our programming in two weeks. There will be one last uh, pre-Christmas evening. Um, that will be December twenty-first. Thursday, 21st. Christopher Dunn um, uh, will be here from New Orleans, and uh, he's one of the few non-Brazilian speakers left on the program. 
uh, and he's well, who uh, speaks Portuguese. I he's, mean. He speaks Portuguese. <laughs> yes. He's written he's written a book on a wonderful book on Tropicalia, and uh, last year he published a book on uh, Brazilian counterculture in the 1960s, and I'm sure. Um, it will be worth your while to come back here and uh, spend that evening with us. Thank you so much for coming and see you down there. Thank you. Bye-bye.